Last time on Genre Junkies. You remember Amanda. Hey, Amanda. Hey. So I know what you're thinking out there. You're like, oh, this is a Beauty and the Beast retelling about a girl that gets kidnapped into the world of fairy. How can you possibly make three books about that subject? For me, this book is absolutely obsession. Yeah, I'm, I'm right there with you. I think it has a broad appeal. I 100% agree, and I think that um, broad is good here. Welcome back. Welcome back, everybody. All right, now we can talk about the end of the first book and the second and third book with all the spoilers we want. Because we've all read it, right? We've all read it. We've all loved it. We've all whatevered it. Uh, so we can talk about it. Here we go. Gloves Here we go, people. Off, Let's people. get real. So, Farah, curse breaker. Curse breaker, turns out. Well, and we <laughs> needed her to be. Um, she needed to come to save the fairy world, at least for a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, she she got in there. She uh, got under the mountain. Yes. And um, can we say she went through some things? She went through some shit. She went through some stuff. <laughs> now, I know when I first read this, I told Amanda immediately, I love Under the Mountain. Under the Mountain is my favorite part of this book. This is where Farah is in her abyss and she's going through trials. Literal trials for the life of her, um, her love. Which, Tamlin. Yeah, which again, I would say this is Cupid and Psyche or Eros and Psyche. Yes. It, she literally, it, it follows in it so beautifully from, from the classical story where she's, you know, married off to this guy, which of course in our book, she isn't married to him yet, but mm -hmm. um, she's married off to this guy and she can't see him. That's part of the thing because if she saw him, she would know he, who he was and that's part of the deal and I forget why. <laughs> Not <laughs> important. The, the original Not story. important. <laughs> um, but she can't see him. That's that's where the masks come in. And then when she finally does figure things out, he goes away. Yeah. And she has to, I think it's actually his mama, Aphrodite, who puts her through a bunch of trials to basically see if she's worthy of her son's love. In this story, we get a little darker. It's not <laughs> yeah. quite that. It's not a It's not a love thing. No. Um, but she does, again, have to go through literal trials in order to get back to Tamlin. Um, and the person who is holding, beho beholding all of this is this absolutely wonderfully, wonderfully evil villainess named Amarantha. Mm -hmm. And she is a cruel, evil rapist bitch, but you're here for it because she's compellingly written and just so unrelenting, no conscious whatsoever, completely 100% convicted in holding these fairy kingdoms under her power. She is a um, general, basically, of this evil king who's off on this big island of Hybern, the king of Hybern. And she's kind of his agent in the field, and she's been holding all these fairies hostage at her whim for hundreds of years. She's just well, for 50 years. But she, I'm she's, sorry, yeah. 50 years. I shouldn't exaggerate. No, but well, she fought in the war 500 years ago yes. and then seemed to go away after some stuff went down. But it turns out she never really went away. And no. She comes back 100 years ago yeah. and starts saying like, oh, I'm so sorry, Mia Copa, for everything I did <laughs> sure. during the war. And that kind of draws them in enough where they're willing to listen. And that's when she sprays her trap. Yes, and she is just unapologetic and unrelenting, and um, it's always cool to see that in a villain, especially a female villain. She is mm -hmm. she is not likable. She's not good, and yet Amanda and I are sick and twisted people, and we kind of liked her. <laughs> <laughs> I can't say I'm on Team Amarantha. No, but I love a villain who uh, unapologetic. Just, yeah, exactly. Who's just a villain? Just, just a goddamn villain. Damn villain. Yeah, the villain is the hero of her own story. <laughs> Absolutely. Story. And she's got Tamlin as this weird love slave. And that's a cool uh, role reversal. It's almost like reverse harem, this whole thing she's got going on. And then uh, Reese, Reesend, who is the High Lord of the Night Court, who Farrah met briefly before she really knew all what's going on, is a major player down here under mm -hmm. the mountain. He's kind of Amarantha's, I hate to say lover because it makes me want to puke, but... <laughs> Well, the, but the other high lords and people disdain him. They absolutely hate him. Yeah. He seems to be this arrogant, evil, uh, evil a-hole. And they call him Amparanthus Horror, both behind his back or in Lucian's case, the straight shooter, right to his face. <laughs> right to his damn face. <laughs> right to his face. Uh, and he, you know, whatever, he seems to kind of brush it off. It's um, kind of like whatever, like kind of better to be in the devil's side than in its path, you right. know? Yeah. All that. Turns out that's all bravado. It's nonsense. 
he is a much, much deeper character than that, who is fighting desperately tooth and nail for his people and to keep the people of the Night Court safe and hidden and secure. He has basically sacrificed himself as this huge distraction to Amarantha, and he talks her out of killing a lot of innocent people, <laughs> like under the mountain and everywhere right. else. Well, all making it sound like it's in her best interest to do so. Right. Um, it helps also, he's a, I'm going to say it wrong, but a demati, one who can actually control minds, get into people's heads and things like that that's part of that's kind of the the big juice behind his power he's also winged but nobody knows that yeah because he can go back and forth having wings not having wings although i'm yeah yeah i know it's in this book that you figured he's that out. uh he's nondescriptly tan which most of his people are which i guess we're supposed to kind of be like he's a person of color i i think you can go that way i whatever he's she thinks the first time she sees him in the first book that is the most handsome man I have ever seen in my life. So whatever that means to you, just yeah. put that in there. It says oh, many times yeah. he has eyes of crushing blue and very dark hair. Violet eyes. Violet eyes, yes. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. Crushing blue is a different high lord. <laughs> That's but a anyway, different high lord. <laughs> so, you know, but you can apply that wherever. Um, Eye and hair color don't mean a whole lot in this world. No. Uh, but anyway, it's just kind of funny. I, I kind of remarked on that. I was like, I I kind of pictured in my head like he's like the Nightcore people are kind of Middle Eastern. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know where it's, I got you know, that. It's, well, one of the beautiful things once you get into like the real Night Court is that High Fae and then Lesser Fae, as we find out that they're yeah. called, just mingle. They're fine. They're, yeah. They all kind of live together. It's almost a little mini utopia where they're living in this <laughs> Valaris. Valaris. So, starlight. But before that, we got to get out from underneath the goddamn mountain. Yeah, we got out from under the mountain. <laughs> You're right. Um, Farrah does beautifully at her trials. Uh, she is humiliated. She is starved. She is beaten. She's and kept in a cell for three months. Only yes. let out at night under Reason's uh, auspices. Yeah. Um, and he dresses her up like kind of a um, sexual plaything <laughs> and basically gets her drunk every night and makes her dance for him. But of course, we find out later on, that's it. That's all that he did. He puts this paint on her so that she can see in the morning that he did not assault her. And he lets her forget right what happened and other characters are pretty dark down there <laughs> other a characters lot of really bad stuff kind of tell her like she's basically just dances and gives people especially him lap dances um and that's not to say just <laughs> but <laughs> yeah, i mean it sucks but you definitely get the feeling she she tells you over and over again if he hadn't done that amarantha would have found much much worse things for her to have done yeah so he figured dancing and forgetting about it was the lesser of two evils he's trying to he does some pretty crummy things to her but it's all revealed to be uh, for a reason to keep her alive and it's kind of sweet actually well and i think you know it's also it sounds like it's not sweet at all but But it is (laughs) but ultimately i think i think you get the idea pretty early on in the story anytime they interact together all is not what it seems with him yes he he sort of shows her in little ways that he's very broken and alone and sometimes even flat out says things about that it's because it's like she's the only person in the world that he can open up to at all i mean he's like he's sacrificing himself to keep his entire kingdom and other people under the mountain safe he is allowing himself to be raped repeatedly by this evil woman that is not easy to digest and so you have to see that it's really not that he's just kind of sacrificing like farah to do shit like i mean he's He's putting himself through worse than anybody because he so deeply wants to keep others alive. He has a big, I don't know, he has a big heart. Uh, hey, my boy Lucian's down there. Yep, yep, we're all down there right now. <laughs> we're we're all under the mountain. And uh, he helps Farrah. I mean, he helps her as much as he possibly can. Yeah, at great personal cost. He comes to her cell in secret and heals yeah. her and during her first trial. He helps her in a way which he can't possibly deny. Amarantha hears it, she sees it, and she plots what she's going to do to punish him. Yeah. Um. But so even at, uh, even at his great personal cost, he's willing to do it because he's he not believes really- in her. And at, at that point, they are friends. It's kind yes. of a weird friendship that they have um, because he was so nasty to her. It's a hate to love friendship. Her. Exactly. <laughs> But yeah, but he is a good guy and he cares about her. Uh, Reese and also Reese to show other stuff that he does. 
he bets on her to win from the very beginning through all her trials. And he also pipes in the soothing music for her. Which she doesn't in this book no, know that that's him. That, that he did that. It's not a huge shocking reveal, in my opinion, that you find yeah. out that, oh, no. it was Reese who was doing it. Because she's going through some really dark stuff. And she's about ready to just drop her basket. She's yeah. about ready to be done. She's She is breaking psychologically and everything else. Her but heart he is cares really about her. He cares about her and wants to keep her in the fight because he thinks she's worth it. Well, and it turns out they're also made into each other. <gasps> okay, we'll let's it. just keep kind of just wrap up book one here real quick. Um, So Farah has to kill people under the mountain. She has to do some really bad shit under the mountain. And she dies. And in order to be resurrected, all of the High Lords, to thank her for what she did and for being the curse breaker, give her a little bit of their life source, their mm-hmm. magic, to bring her back to life, which is uh, really cool. Because that's not something fairies dole out very <laughs> willingly. And so Farrah comes alive, and she's gonna go home to the spring court with Tamlin, who pretty awesomely lops off Amaranth's head, if memory serves. After and having sat by her side and showing no emotion because he didn't want to give Amaranth any yes. ammunition to use against Farrah. Because the whole thing, time that she's down there doing the trials, he's pretending he doesn't know her and there's really no relationship, even though Farrah is saying, but I love you, I'm here for you. And yeah. Amaranth clearly thinks that that's the case, but she keeps waiting for Tamlin to crack a little bit. Yeah, and he holds pretty fast because he really loves her a whole lot. So then we get to the next book, and the second book, as we all know, is Court of Mist and Fury. I love to mix up these titles. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Me too. <laughs> they get progressively longer. The first one is about 400-something. The second one jumps up to, I think, over 600 pages, and then the third one clocks in at, like, 699 pages. They get progressively it's bigger. It's a at, lot of book. As epic fantasy tends to do. Yeah. So in the second book, let me just, okay. Everybody's out from under the mountain. Amaranth is dead. Uh, we know, obviously, there's going to be a higher, bigger threat looming with this King of Hybern, who's obviously uh, back to some extent. Right. Because Amarantha they established, back. like you said, Amarantha was one of his generals. Like, um, this isn't even the big dog you're dealing with. Right. So here's something I really appreciate. Let's just get this over right away. Farah, Reese, and Tam, Tamlin, all have PTSD. Mm-hmm. They have serious emotional fallout from their ordeals and i appreciate that because sometimes in books especially these kind of epic fantasy you don't see that fallout that like things really screwed people up and they all handle it differently tamlet handles it very unhealthily Mm -hmm. bottles it up but um i was happy that this gave something these characters to actually work through for two books yeah i mean you can't spend three months in basically hell and then come out the next day and be like it's chill though we're home now (laughs) or all those years in reese's case yeah and in reese's case or in tamlin's case too because tamlin was living with the threat of this curse for 50 years as well i was scared when this book started because farah is gonna get married to tamlin and he really wants her to just be his pretty perfect little trophy wife and he doesn't want to know about the fact that she's a high fey now and because we find out of all these high lords resurrecting her she has powers she is really 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 powerful yeah because- more so than most high fey but not as high as the lords i guess no i i think the thing is that because she has a piece of the power of all of them that she's at least their equal yeah, but Reese is like hella powerful. Well, that's that's a thing that comes in there too that she eventually finds out that Reese is the most powerful high lord in history. So, that's cool. So, <laughs> Here's where many people, including myself, got a little, what? (laughs) In this book. It's not enough for her to have changed and Tamlin to have changed and for them to not be in love anymore. Tamlin becomes a psychopath. He becomes a psycho where you are seriously worried for her safety because he cannot control his temper and like literally rips rooms and furniture apart, does not like let her leave the compound he completely changes he completely changes and there was always kind of shades of that in the first book that maybe he was a little little controlling uh, a little hot under the collar let's say 
but he swings to irredeemable in this book. And I- from, from what I've heard, this is something that Sarah J. Mass has done before. Where when she makes the like the big ship split, it's like she salts the earth so nothing will ever grow again. <laughs> and it's like, um, I found it very jarring because I did not have such a visceral reaction to Tamlin. I kind of liked that he was the softer one in the first book and she was the colder one. But now all of a sudden he is insane and he is allowing himself to be completely manipulated by this high priestess, Iantha. It was shocking to me. It was really shocking to me. I don't know. I wasn't I wasn't that taken aback by it. I mean, I totally get why people are slash were. Um, to me, it's like once once you kind of dig into that, you know, what they've all been through kind of thing. Um, and Farah basically, she can't sleep through the night anymore. She wakes up with just these night terrors and yeah. pukes her guts up. She That's where she's at. She doesn't find joy in anything anymore because it used to because she's always been really sensitive to kind of color and texture, being a painter, being an artist, or at least as- aspiring to be one. Now, Oh, it's like when she sees colors, it triggers memories that she had under the mountain. I think that's all legit. So I think if you're putting yourself into that mm-hmm. thing, then the Tamlin's thing is it just sort of increases where he was before. I mean, it, we didn't mention this before, but his his big like kind of cool thing that he can do <laughs> as, a, as a high lord <laughs> is he's a major shapeshifter. So he, he, he shapeshifts into this like feral beast, claws and a whole lion thing going on and stuff. Like that's, that's his like inner demon, if you will. So it's not a shock to me that that's where it goes plus if you look at him in the first book he is keeping her protected and keeping her safe all the time which is the character that she was the person she was where she was in her life in the first book that's yeah. what she needed she wanted she needed and wanted somebody to take care of her for once because yes. she had been the only one caring for her entire family since almost she can remember and she needed somebody to give her a safe place where there was beauty and there was time to paint and that's what she needed and that's what she wanted and Tamlin was able to swoop in and provide that like that's exactly the person he wanted to be to someone yeah he couldn't save the world he couldn't save his people it was a matter of time it's a ticking bomb but here's this little person that i can keep safe and of course you know of course love kind of transpires from that so here we are we've moved into everything that happens and he wants to just go back to that now yeah he wants to go back to that so bad he can't let go of it and he he but it's extreme it is but at the same time it i don't know i don't think it's any more extreme than kind of where she goes because she she reverts okay. hardcore back to being <laughs> but here's the thing is Farah also and for the better makes a huge like 180 basically once she's escaped from under the mountain and she's a high fae now now suddenly she's got like her shit together like hardcore she is like a much more evolved person she's a stronger person she's also i mean it's a pretty quick change and i'm okay with it because she's been through stuff but for me both of those characters morphed really fast and i don't think i'm alone in feeling that they changed really quickly I'm sure you're not i just for me it didn't feel that way i felt like there was a legitimate journey of, of kind of the emotional tapestry there for both of the i'm well for especially for Farah because it's her story that we're yeah. following and like I, I mean tamlin does some crummy things in the first book i'm not like this huge huge tamlin fan or anything because i saw some chinks and some problematic ways that he treated her but i just found it was really funny how suddenly it was like damn tamlin you're horrible you are horrible um but the thing is he doesn't mean to be that way you know i mean like it's a not i mean that's like every <laughs> okay yeah it sounds bad it. yeah but but <laughs> but but i mean but i think it legitimately he's he's trying he even tries to give her more freedom and he just can't figure it out i'm not saying i'm i'm not on team tamlin here <laughs> you're not a tamlin all. apologist no no not at all I, I really am not and i'm sorry if i'm coming off that way it's just it didn't seem to me to be that big of a stretch that that's how he comes back from under the mountain and for me with her it's she's really broken when she comes back from under the mountain and the fact that once she gets a taste of of freedom and independence once uh when she ends up going to the night court mm-hmm. um the fact that she does rebound i i don't think it's that quickly in my opinion um oh, okay when so she we does don't... rebound i think that she's sort of able to marry some parts of her together again um well i i think we are glad that it ends up where it does regardless if not totally <laughs> on the journey to get there um she comes out a better person for all of it 
And the story is better for all of it because at this point, especially, I'm not like we ever did, but we really don't want Farah to be this like happy little homemaker who's like just content to be a broodmare for Tamlin in the spring well, court. And I, th- I think that part of that too, and maybe the quick transition that a lot of people are experiencing, that the thing is she's going back to who she really is. Because who she really is survivor. is that girl who overcame every obstacle, she's taught survivor. herself how to survive, and became stronger for it. Now, unfortunately, she lost a lot of a sense of joy and a sense of herself in that in the beginning of the first book that's where we meet her and she has to bring that back so she mm-hmm. got to unfortunately they undid all of that kind of self-knowledge that she got because of her torture and, and torment and i think that's legit so i think that when she kind of reawakens to herself it admits part of the issues that she has when she actually admits it to Cassian when he's training her. Oh. You know, they're in the ring and they're fighting it out and he kind of provokes her into saying something and she finally breaks down and um, admits that, you know, she she can't get over the murder <laughs> that she had to commit when she was down there. She had to kill innocent lives. Yeah, beyond anything else that she had to do, that's the thing that sticks with her. And I think I th- I just, I don't know, I like the way that she comes back from that because well, of it course. seems to me to be legitimate. I agree on that. And I mean, her arc, like, the whole book and into the second book too no she's much better for the arc and for changing for me it all just felt her change and tamlin's change the initial ones felt very abrupt for me but it's all for the better it's all for the better because reese is who she's really supposed to be with he rescues her even lucian who's her dear friend he is had such a crampy life he has had such a hard time of things tamlin saved him he feels very loyal and indebted to tamlin he can't stand up for Feyre. it's a huge bummer uh, because he's such a great character and he has to do some kind of douchey things but that leads to a bigger arc down the road for him too mm-hmm. but anyway um we'll, we'll, we'll circle back around to lucian because i i just want to talk about him a little bit more in the third book well it turns out part of tamlin's complete psychosis is that after the events of the second book he ends up completely selling out Farrah and her family to hybern which is kind of like wow that is desperate and scary but before we get to that point, Farrah becomes well indoctrinated into the Night Court, which is in fact not a court of assholes, but a court of wonderful people. <laughs> um, because there are two sides to it. Well, yes, there's, there's the public side that everybody knows about, the court of nightmares. There's a little offshoot, which he still rules over, but he kind of like uh, lets this other dude he's, uh, named Kier, who's a real asshat, kind of run. <laughs> and he, um, that is what I kind of thought the court of night was. And that's why I really liked it in the first book. I was like, oh, yeah. I'm a night court. I'm these crazy evil mofos and weird and nightmare people. Um, (laughs) But turns out that's just kind of the public face that he lets everybody see because he loves his people dearly. And there are wonderful people in the court of uh, dreams uh, over there. And he has a beautiful family unit. And before we talk about the family unit, I want to say that a wonderful, wonderful strength of this book is that, yes, there is an instant mating bond that Reese feels, but it is not insta-love between him and Feyre. It is definitely a Hades Persephone. It is a hate to love. I was just going to say that's if yeah. the first book is Cupid and the Psyche, this one is Hades and Persephone. And I love, love, love that. I yes. love that she brought that into, into the world and was able to justify that story within her own context in this one. Yeah, and he does some great things for her like giving her agency over her own decisions again and freedom and teaches her to read which is like the most important freaking thing in the whole book in my opinion and treats her with a lot of respect like so much respect um and it's really wonderful and there's like nothing problematic about their relationship for the last two books it's one based on like love and respect and equality and he's like mutual trust and and he's like no you will be my high lady and people will treat you like the high lady you're not just my wife and um they even have a wonderful conversation when they're both you know admitted they love each other and they're like yeah it'd be really cool to have kids someday together not right now and it's like thank you (laughs) Thank you for not jumping immediately into childbearing right. when we are just... I that too. I'm like, as soon as it got together, I was kind of like, oh, no, don't, 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 don't do it. Don't do it. Don't go full Bella. Because they have this freedom together that they both haven't had because of their, his enslavement and her weird life. And it's really beautiful. It's really, really beautiful. Um, let's talk about his family. Let's do the Court of Dreams. Okay. The Court of Dreams. Um, he has a little inner circle of... 
advisors and people who are his BFFs forever. Mm-hmm. And we and love they them. Have different, they have placement within his court, too. It's it's not honorary. These are actual working titles. Yes. And I think I'm not alone when I say that these characters quickly become all of our precious, precious children, our precious babies. <laughs> and we yes. love them so much. And we want nothing bad to ever happen to them. They are wonderful. Yes, they are wonderful. But they are also, all of them, not perfect. They no. also all have their own pain. But we love them. We, we love them. But partly because of that. Uh, we have Morgan, who is his cousin, who is a, they call her like sometimes the Morgan, and she's this warrior, she's like this fabled creature of myth, she's a relentless, bloody fighter, and she's beautiful, and she's cool, and a smart battle lady, but yeah. also kind of has like a funny, like kind of girly side. Well, that's a, the thing that I think Farah notices about her first is that she just she just loves freely. She seems to just be exactly who she is yeah. from the very beginning, and that is such a rare treat. And um, she's going from this experience with Iantha, um, where Crazy Iantha piece, said priestess. she was her best friend, but then she yeah. was basically controlling everything she did, and she let her do it because she was so broken and out of herself. And she's she like, okay, okay, yeah. tell me what to do. She doesn't okay. wanted somebody to point her in the right direction. She wasn't really part of her life anymore so then she comes to the court of dreams and there's more who give a darn (laughs) about what she wears or what she you know how she comports herself she's like just do you honey kind of thing and that's that's awesome she She didn't more immediately right you love her and you love all of them um in the night court because you are led to believe from Farrah and from her limited experience, that it can't be this good, that fairies can't be this awesome. And it's like, no, there's this whole other world of fairies and they're different than what you know. Um, So Morgan has a weird kind of love triangle with Cassian and Asriel. I don't even <laughs> want to talk about that. Uh, um, I mean, it's, it's, it does. It, it's interesting on a character relationship level, but it doesn't. It doesn't have any real plot. No, um, Asriel. At least at this moment, Asriel is a shadow singer. He's an assassin. He's the spy master, slinking around in the shadows, um, cat-like, awesome. It should be said too that Cassian and Asriel are Illyrians. Yes, which is to say that they're they look like high fae, but they also have these massive, awesome wings. And there's a whole thing that goes along with being an Alarian. They're really their own um, subculture, almost a race of uh, people that have their own rules and laws, and they're, they're kind of screwed up, yeah. <laughs> but interesting. Mm-hmm. And Reese, it turns out, is half Illyrian, and then his father was the High Lord, so that's why he can have wings if he wants them, but he can hide them when he doesn't want them. And Cassian is the general. He is like a total total warrior, you know, Ares, god of war type of dude, a brilliant strategist, but just bloodthirsty, but not an asshole, you know, just a true fighter's fighter. Mm -hmm. Now, both of them, all three of them so far we've mentioned are fighters, but they have these wonderful, beautiful hearts of gold. And then the last person that makes out his inner circle is Amran, Mm -hmm. which uh, rumor has it is your favorite character in the series. (laughs) I I am I love Amran from the very first. I loved her. I think she's described as Farah as like she looks at her and looks into her eyes and she knows like she's not high fae. She's something else. She's basically some beast in a meat suit who got kind of <laughs> trapped in a in a meat suit and she knows everything like ever and she's sarcastic and dry. But you also just know, like, if if you make her mad, she she'll kill you. Like, she'll just she'll flat out kill you. I mean, she's very um, classy. If you love books and stories where there's a group of best super friends who are basically all obsessed with each other, this is it. This is it. <laughs> and I um, think that. And it's beautiful. It's wonderfully written how much all of these characters care about each other and the way they work together and the way they sometimes fight and don't get along just like real friends and family do. Mm-hmm. But they always come back and they always come back to each other. And you watch the incredible painful broodingness that is Asriel, who loves more and it's a little you know more does the oh i love you but i can't be in love with you thing and yeah there, there's a there's a lot of stuff there and i feel like we're in gonna, a few minutes when we get to the we'll put a book, pin in that gonna, we'll yeah, come back in the third book <laughs> um but i uh, yeah so what's really important to take away at the end well not really but as a segue what's really important to take away at the end of this book is that the king of hybrid is back he's evil as hell tamlin has sold out Farah's family and the entire kingdom of Prithian to the king of Hybern. 
And there's like mortal queens from the mortal Pharaoh's old place that are kind of in on all this and they want to be Fae. And so to kind of test how it's all going to work out, they throw uh, Pharaoh's human sisters, Nesta and Elaine, into the cauldron for them to become Fae. And that's that has a big a deal. a couple of different consequences. So kind of on that note, because the second and third book really bleed into each other. They, they really do. It's hard to separate the two. To Take a, a tiny extent. little stretch break. Go get something to drink. And let's wrap this sucker up. Enjoying the show? Please like and subscribe on iTunes. You can find us on Twitter and Instagram at Genre Junkies. And don't forget to visit the website, genrejunkies.com. And without further ado, let's talk about the uh, end of the book here. Well, not oh, the yeah. end, end of the book, but... Most of the events taking place in a court of wings and ruin. So now we've got a problem. <laughs> we have Ferris sisters are Faye now. And in order to uh, keep things progressing and not uh, bring about the apocalypse too soon, Farah has to go back to the spring court with Tamlin. Uh, that's kind of part of the deal to let all of her family of the night court kind of go free. Yeah, she has to let them believe that the king of Highburn has snapped the mating bond like that's something you can do. It's not something you between can do. Between her and Reese. And she suddenly, went, oh my goodness, where have I been for the past six months? Yeah. Uh, oh, Tammy, bring me back home. <laughs> and, and of course, yeah. he wants it to be true so badly he believes it. Another interesting thing I'm sure you were just about to get to yeah. this. Elaine goes into the cauldron and comes back out high fae beautiful she's yeah. great anyway so she comes out as a gorgeous high fae woman nesta goes in and comes back as something else something darker she's not exactly high fae there's something thrumming and dark and deep about her power when she comes back out because she's nothing but steel and fire to begin with another interesting thing happens when they come out of the cauldron sandra what happens <laughs> oh yeah suddenly lucian okay well <laughs> lucian uh <laughs> imprints <laughs> for lack of a better word the mating bond clicks into place between him and Elaine. Which Elena? is kind of a shock. Elaine? Yeah, Elaine. That's what I said. And it is a shock. It's uh, quite a twist. It's a little neat. You know, here we are, we're pairing everybody off. But it's fine. Yeah, but again, this is romance fantasy. It's, it's fine. It's, you know, it's part of the landscape. So Lucy and Tam and Farah, Farah head back to the spring court. And true to her word... Feyre is deciding to bring down the spring court because Tam sold out her family and there's just some stuff you don't do. <laughs> and um, it's not just her night court family, but her sisters by, you know, getting them involved in this whole ridiculous thing. Mm -hmm. And she does it. She brings down his court by sowing the seeds of dissent beautifully mm -hmm. and just brings that damn place to ruin now unfortunately that what opens up a wonderful floodgate for highburn to just totally take control over that right lucian escapes with Feyre because well first of all he knows that he cannot serve tamlin anymore because tamlin's gone off his rocker and he wants to be reunited with elaine who he's now mated to for a large chunk of this book, Farah is really unforgiving to Lucian, and he did douchey things, like I said. I'm not saying he was perfect, but he had a horrible, horrible life. He went through a lot of stuff, and Tamlin offered him a chance at salvation and freedom, and he became very loyal to him. That was his BFF. That was his ride or die. And then Tamlin went psycho. And it's like, Feyre, could you please just be forgiving to Lucian? Like, could you just forgive him? And it takes her a long time. <laughs> Too long. But she does. <laughs> it must be said that Sandra's favorite character in the book pretty yeah. much is Lucian. Yeah. So I want to say, take that with a grain of salt, listeners, readers. I don't think I'm wrong. <laughs> I don't know that you're wrong necessarily. But I think her lack of forgiveness is so deep and intrinsic a part of who she is as a character that it makes sense to me. She does not forgive easily. She doesn't <laughs> forgive her father. She doesn't forgive oh, her Oh, but sisters. she wants everyone to forgive her. 
Well, but see, she doesn't forgive herself, though. So I don't, That's I don't true. know. I don't think she really seeks forgiveness or any of that from anyone else either. Like, I don't think that she really grasps the concept of forgiveness, which is challenging for all of us. So speaking of being paired off, Nesty, Nesty, <laughs> Nesta and Cassian Nesty. have a lot of tension between them. Talk about a great love to hate arc um, that does not really get wrapped up. No. That's actually kind of um, a little bit of a gripe about this book, as much as I loved it, and I loved the whole series, nothing is perfect. And there's a lot that kind of gets sloughed off onto the fact that we know there's going to be companion novels. Well, maybe this is a good time to address it. Here, Here's how I felt the books went. She had this wonderful idea for this whole universe. Yeah, I could be wrong about this. And she she loved, you know, obviously she was in love with this sort of uh, format of taking these like ancient stories or these myths and tying them into her world, which I also think is awesome. I yes. eat that stuff up with a spoon. So she has her Beauty and the Beast thing at the, the first book. Well, but everything's not as it seems. So at the end of that, she sort of figures, oh, there's more story to tell. And so she kind of bridges it into the second story yes now we're gonna turn things upside down change some paradigms i wish i again i'm i'm there for i'm showing up and she's setting everything else up for book three as a conclusion yeah this is the story is getting there we're gonna get to the climax of it all this larger meta foe is coming to town you know i'm there for all of that and then it felt to me like somewhere around halfway through this book maybe earlier than that she maybe found out she was gonna get to write maybe as many books as she wanted to about this right because these are huge and success. suddenly all these setups that we had that I'm, I don't want to say they were necessarily clear, um, but we were kind of hoping for kind of get dashed away sometimes in totally absurd fashion, in my opinion. Um, um, I'm picking again, up what you're laying down. Yeah, yeah, I just I felt like somewhere in there we decided, oh, no, this isn't the end of the story. There's a lot more story. And so there's some things where it's like you kind of feel like maybe maybe we've earned this. <laughs> yeah, maybe these characters have earned a little bit of closure. And no, nope, we're not going to no, get that. We're now. not going to get any closure. And in fact, we're going to be left with even more wounds <laughs> that are going to have to be um, healed and resolved. Now, again, I will say, by and large, I loved these books. Um, don't get me, me wrong. And me I think too. you do, too. But it is kind of hard when it's like having that feeling of there's really no risk in the third book especially because everybody is like totally okay and they're gonna be totally okay even when they die they don't really die and there's so much unresolved stuff you know it's gonna bleed into more books it's kind of funny that it's like a 700 page book where things don't quite get resolved the high burn arc gets resolved it it does, and and it, you know, and I'm I'm on board for a long series. I, I love those. Same. That's high fantasy. I I just feel like this was it. It feels to me like this was intended to be a trilogy. That then we just kind of pulled the punch <laughs> towards right. the end and decided no, we, we're not going to conclude this and then just simply go on a new adventure the next time. No, we're just going to keep the seeds of this one still going. The problems we had aren't really fixed. It's, it's kind of so Bob Rick in that way. Yeah. And I get exactly what you're saying. And I feel hypocritical because I love these books and I love these characters and too. I want everybody to be okay. And I want there to be more stuff. And I can't wait. I'm going to friggin' gobble up like a greedy little gopher like these companion novels. Too. I feel I feel guilty even like saying, hey, but I it's see the a big truth. problem here. But it just it felt a little bit of like a gut punch. Um, Speaking of gut punch, there's <laughs> one thing that's cool. Let me set this up a little bit, is that especially in the third book, but in the second one too, we are opened up more to the world of Fae. We see that there's more diversity, not only in described ethnically in people's skin color, but we also meet some mostly male um, bi and gay characters, mm -hmm. some females mentioned too. And that had been something that I have now learned from further research had been a big criticism is how heteronormative these books had been mm -hmm. until the third book. So now we know that Moore is queer. She is basically homo romantic um, mm -hmm. and can only love her own gender, truly love. And that's why she has not pulled the trigger with Azriel. And Moore gives these um, monologues that are very beautiful and emotional, and I felt very genuine mm -hmm. about how she has felt the need to be closeted for, like, uh, maybe 500 years, which seems mm -hmm. like a long time. Sure, but in the context of a fae life, I guess, 
you just you can't really hit the fast forward button. <laughs> and I love her. I still love her. I will always love her. And I just want her to be happy and to find a good woman <laughs> and Me you know too. uh all of that stuff. However, you and I both kind of said I, shenanigans on this yeah, one. Yeah, I, I bumped on the whole Moore's reveal thing on a, a couple different levels, but mostly because that's like her defining characteristic all the way up until that <laughs> moment when she reveals this about herself is that she is so open and so free because of everything that she's been through and she's been through some really really oh my bad God. stuff bad. that she's just like you need to live your own life live your own truth like that's been she's gone full Oprah all the way through and then you yes. find out this huge thing about her that like I guess people do that in real life they kind of carry around these these secrets things that they, they don't know how to address uh, yeah. but it just didn't feel like it was in the right place here me neither and what i could really narrow it down to for me was the fact that it had never been foreshadowed that more was at all queer so to just suddenly have her be a queer character feels plot twisty it because does. there wasn't any breadcrumbs, there wasn't any seeds, because if that had been, then I wouldn't have felt it was plot twisty. But the yeah. fact that there's no foreshadowing, and then all of a sudden, she reveals who she really is, I would have been a lot more comfortable <laughs> with it if she, if we hadn't, if it hadn't felt like a plot twist. Well, you know, that's the thing. I Maybe that's just me. I feel like if there's <laughs> these characters that have been around for centuries, I feel like they they they're probably all gender queer to a certain extent, like vampires like, in exactly, a lot of like books. It just didn't, it seemed to me to be sort of a, a, a given. No, I mean, that's just maybe my mentality. I'm I don't know, but um. <laughs> so so when it's revealed that this is a big thing for her, I was like, oh, is, is this a is this a big thing in this world? But it's not. It didn't seem like it because we've mentioned so many other characters without any any kind of problem. Yeah, <laughs> societal issue. It, it's it. a problem. So like suddenly, it was a problem for where she... some issue that she's overcoming. I just. I, I, it's not that it's bad and it's cool if that's the way you know you yeah. want to do it as an author but it just it it just it you're right it, it felt um shoehorned shoehorned if it, it just it felt like it was kind of doing a disservice to a community of readers out there yeah um where it's like couldn't this have just been a truth about her maybe fairy didn't know yeah um, if you wanted to reveal it and, and be like hey this is the reason why Ezreal and i can't ever really be together because i really can't love him that way yeah because that's cool but in you know yes. making it such a big thing just it seems like you're it's like making it weird now <laughs> because it's only a big thing because of how she was raised in the court of nightmares she explains to us through these monologues that it's not okay in the court of nightmares to be gay but it's okay in every other part of fairy yeah i don't know it's it's a little bit rough, and I think I speak for both of us when I say we're happy. We love that there's diversity now, finally. Oh, I mean, I love, that, I love that she is gay, or however, of whatever course. her personal terminology That's is. That's wonderful. It doesn't. I just. It just didn't need to be a thing. She could have suddenly had a girlfriend, and I wouldn't have blinked an eye. It would have been fine. Yeah, would have been like, oh yeah, and I mean, and now it feels even more plot twisty because it's like, well, how the, the hell is Azrael gonna take this? Where are we going to go with Az now? Because it's been so set up that the two of them have this will they, See, won't they thing. That's that's another part of where I'm saying it. She kind of let like him on. There was, well, there, there, I think that she kind of let us all on because it just seemed <laughs> like that was, it was going to be a huge hurdle. But when he finally admitted to himself that he was worth her, because that's literally what Moore tells it. This is almost a weird thing. <laughs> that that's literally what Moore tells Feyre is the problem isn't actually me. It's Asriel, he ne has never felt anything other than this bastard born son of a whatever who would never be even worth Illyrian wings. Ugh. He feels so low about himself that he could never, never be with me. And it's like, that's that's the hinge pin of where you think their problem is with them yeah. ever getting together. And then for it to be like, nope, in fact, I'm not going to mention that ever again. We're just going to say the problem is because I like chicks. Like, whoa, 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 It's whoa, like, whoa, do whoa. you think, oh, God, and I feel like I'm being mean to more, and I'm not because I love her so much, but it's like, do you think maybe in these several hundred years that you y'all been friends and he's been pining for you, you could have maybe have even told just him? Like... 
Like, please find yourself someone who can really love you. I don't know, God. It's just, I, it's just, no, it, it just, it just. It just feels shoehorned. It feels a little forced, like, to make more be queer. I, why can't she just been this wonderful queer woman from the whole time? Yeah, that's that's where I am, too. Because like, we love it. That, we love that's more, like, let more be more. Let more be more because we were so down. Um... Yeah, so I feel like we're both kind of on the same page with this book. We're full of contradictions because we love it, love it, love it. Mm, we get up with a little spoon. Absolutely. Obviously. We love these books, but at the same time, it feels rushed, weird. Um, things are not concluded cleanly because we know we're going to get these companion books. And it's so, I like I said before, I don't want anything to happen to my beautiful, wonderful fae children that I love so much. But at the same time, I'm like... Well, I mean, somebody could have died. Like, I mean, there could have been some. There could have been some loss. Yeah. Even I feel like the one death that I felt Risk. like was really like, oh, like, okay, but it's, it, but somehow it's okay was, was Amran's death. You know, I mean, I cried. I'm out. Oh, I cried. On my lunch break I cried. reading this book and I'm, I'm just tears rolling down my face. But I was, but ca- it was so beautiful. You're kind of was... like slow clapping, like, you did it, girl. You well, did that, it. Because the thing is that this isn't her world. This isn't where she's supposed to be anyway. So the idea of her kind of accepting her death and then doing this beautiful this thing with with varian from the summer court yeah. that they they had a real connection like from the beginning even though it, you know, obviously her favorite kind of relationship is hate to love that, that she's able to kind of say i can never quite uh never quite love you the way that you could love me and that's okay because it's my time to go now like then so then she she dies and yet well see so <laughs> she dies she becomes her true self she decimates the high burn army and then no, it's cool. She's back. She's, She's actually fine. back. It wasn't earned. See, that's the thing. It's like there was this beautiful sacrifice. And yeah. then we, we just couldn't well, quite fold. And I think we both agreed but felt less passionately about Reese's death because he dies and comes back too. And it's the same thing of like, we don't want to lose these characters. We love them. But at the same time, in epic fantasy, you're preparing to let a few go. Because- well, I, well, see, Reese's death, though, I felt like the second that she realized he wasn't breathing, I knew that the High Lords were going to bring him back. Oh, yeah. There so wasn't it, any like, risk. That, that felt, it, you that never felt, felt risk. Because it was a callback. So it's like, now they really are equals. Now they've really been on the same road. Literally and to death. their and whole back. relationship is so beautiful. Um, mm-hmm. I hate to, I hate to stop this, but we got it. We got to stop this. Mm-hmm. And in true genre junkie style, I, I do want to give this an execution score. Mm-hmm. Um, we didn't even touch on the Surreal. <gasps> my favorite, my favorite character besides Lucien. Uh, I can't talk about the Sorrel, um, uh, talking about crying, I ugly cried, mm, Scott was a witness, I was not okay, because I'm like, the Sorrel is my best friend, and he's gonna come over, and we're gonna have pizza and tea, and it was gonna be so great, but as an homage to him, how many Sorrels out of five do you give this entire package? Okay, despite the fact that narratively I felt, uh, I don't know, let down or at least disillusioned <laughs> towards the end of the third book. Uh, overall, I mean, she's she's a darn good writer. She's doing some really interesting stuff with relationships and uh, basically. Fairy. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> with fairy, with the fae world. And then also just that things are not always what they seem to be. In fact, they're very rarely what you think they are to begin with. It's part of growing up, folks. <laughs> So yeah, I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna give it four and a half surreals out of five. I think that is a really beautiful way to put it, man. I don't know if I could word it any better myself, honestly. Um, despite flaws, despite questionable shoehorning <laughs> with some characters, uh, twists and whatnot, it still is some really wonderful books. Really, really wonderful, and a lot can be gathered from them. A beautiful fantasy series which elevates the fae subgenre and has some really cool feminist stuff to say about it too um i'm gonna give it four sorrels out of five well you guys i know you have a lot to say we have a lot to say you can always come find us on social media and just gush and pour and weigh in on this stuff and we'd love to talk about it even more with you we could probably make an entire podcast that is just talking about these three tomes um but we won't (laughs) manda thank you Oh, thank you so much for having me. Thank you for joining me on this fairy journey of love. It's been my treat. Now, whatever you're going to read, if you're going to read fantasy, if you're going to read horror, if you're going to read science fiction, just keep reading it past your bedtime. 